So, um, so we're going to figure everything out for you all today. And we chatted a little bit beforehand. And, and, and basically, this is a conversation that all journalists have all the time. Like, well, what's happening? And what's the future? And so we're going to talk about what's happening now. And we're going to talk about the future. Actually, just before I was coming on stage, Kara saw I had a piece of paper stuck to my foot. And she said, you better take that off. And then Joe said, print media. <laughs> so, Kara, <coughs> let's start with you. What, right. what, what is going on? I mean, what um, you've managed to migrate. You're, you're tracking this both you know, as a journalist, but you're also a participant. So you have an, a unique perspective looking sure. at what's going on in media. Well, uh, what we started to do at All Things D, um, I was a reporter, again, for the Washington Post and for the journal. I was their first internet reporter. Um, when I got to the journal, um, I had started covering it at the Washington Post. Um, I went on a book leave to write a book about AOL, the first book where things were going well for that company. Uh, the second one was down. Um, and uh, and I, um, I was just very, once I saw the internet for the first time, I realized it was going to change everything. And I was very, uh, almost uh, just adamant that this was the, the end of newsprint. It was the end of everything that I was doing at the Washington Post, which is an amazing place run by a terrific family, the Grahams. Um, and when I was walking out the door, Don Graham said, um, you know, why are you leaving? Uh, why, are you, why are you leaving the Washington Post? And I said, Don, the water's rising, and you're on a lower plane than the Wall Street Journal. Um, so I want to go up until, and then I'll leave that when I feel like the water's rising there. And one of the things that was really important to me was that, that, that news organizations did not understand what was happening. And when I got to the journal, I was the only internet reporter. Literally, everybody else was covering chips or whatever in tech. Um, one of the media reporters who was, you know, that was the hot thing at the journal to be one of the media reporters covering Time Warner or whatever the big media company was, uh, when I got there said, oh, you'll be covering CB radio. That's what they called the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, the internet's going to kill you. You and your beat and everything else about it is just going to be washed away. Um, and I was very struck by classifieds, how, how the Washington Post, for example, a classified business could be attacked. That was one of its, the bulwarks of its business. Um, they were losing big retailers who weren't advertising anymore. There were better ways to advertise. And so, uh, you know, even while I was at the journal covering the internet, it was almost impossible not to see the biggest implication was on news and how news was delivered. And my whole um, premise was that it, it, people did not want news. They didn't want a newspaper. Like, mm. I, don't, I wasn't reading the newspaper. And so, so years <laughs> later, when the journal was starting to do a Saturday journal, they had focus groups. And, uh, and I'll finish with this. Um, they had focus groups on the Saturday journal and what people liked about it. And I thought the Saturday journal was homework. I was like, oh, great. I have to read the journal on Saturday now. Um, and so I would sit in the back, and they would, uh, they'd say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they finally got to me, and they said, Kara, what do you think about doing a Saturday journal? And I wanted to put all their money into online. That was what I was interested in. And I said, they said, how can we get young people to read the news? And I said, well, if you tape a joint between every page, maybe that'll work. <laughs> and they kicked me out of the focus group. That would group. burn up the paper. <laughs> it would be fantastic. What are you talking about? Um, so, and it would give you a whole new perspective on Warren Buffett. Yeah. So um, <laughs> anyway, so I just was kept pushing it and pushing it. And so finally, I was just going to leave because they didn't want to uh, fund a blog that I wanted to do. I wanted to do a thing called a blog. And the publisher didn't know what a blog was. Um, and so we so pushed. What year was that? This was 2001 or two. Yeah. And I was really pushing them, and Walt Mossberg, my partner, and I really essentially threatened to leave and said, "We're going to. We believe in this. We believe this is the way it's going." And there was a very smart executive there, uh, several Paul Steiger, who was the editor, and another one who funded it and let us do it. Um, and it was it's worked out very well, but it's still a struggle um, within the journal and within the Dow Jones empire for them for everybody to understand how quickly everything is changing and how you can do m more with less. And that struggle, um, alas, is what lots of people in traditional media worry about. They think, well, you know, is it going away? I, I find it a kind of a, a, a strange question, because never in the history of the world has there been more information available to more people in greater amounts, in greater depth, in human history. I mean, it's, it in some ways is the greatest age of media. We just haven't figured out how to charge for it and make money for it. So, and Jim, so you have a foot in both camps. Um, how, how is that going to work? I mean, how will, will traditional media survive? Can they charge for it? I mean, one of the things that we've seen on the web is that people like brands. They like the Washington Post. They like the New York Times. They like Time. And they're pretty much indifferent, as Kara said, to the form that it takes. They don't have to have it on paper. Well, I do think it's fitting that newspaper relic that I am, I'm here in a museum. 
uh, and uh, unlike Kara, did not see any of this coming, was, was clueless, and like much of the newspaper industry, did not see it coming. Uh, I think when key decisions were being made in the 1990s and the turn of the decade, um, you know, it was almost like LBJ and, and Vietnam, another 50,000, another 50,000, then he had 500,000 folks and, you know, soldiers on the ground. And similar with the Internet, you woke up one day and everybody was using the Internet and you had given it away free, and folks are still struggling with that. Um, I come from an industry which has seen its revenues in five years, the American newspaper industry, go from 49 billion, 49 to 24 billion this year. They've come crashing. Um, one third of the folks in newsrooms a decade ago are now gone. And even though uh, I would agree with you, Rick, that yeah, there's a lot of ter greater access instantaneously to lots of sophisticated information, I think if you look at the distinctly local level, the situation is, is very ambiguous. You cannot have had 32 people covering the state legislature in this state uh, two, three years ago and now only have just a little bit above 20 to have major papers like that in the second biggest city, Rockford, pull out of covering the state legislature for financial reasons and not have some ambiguity about the, the quality of uh, local content. So um, we were born uh, as sort of as a result of tumult at the Tribune, the biggest and most sophisticated uh, news engine here in town and one of the bigger ones in the country, owning 30 TV stations, lots of newspaper. Uh, as a result of problems there, they went into bankruptcy. We started this small nonprofit. Um, good news is uh, our main client, the New York Times, for whom we produce a couple of pages on Fridays and Sundays, uh, very happy with the product. The, uh, you know, the not so good news is do we have a sustainable business model? I think that is very unclear at this point. And whether one will be able to get the folks, mostly the old fogies who are paying seven, eight hundred bucks that New York Times print subscription to pay anywhere near that for, um, you know, stuff that they may get online. And I do think, and we can get into this later when it comes to politics, lack of consensus, uh, fragmentation, personalization of, of media. Um, I think there are real potential losses in these local communities where many of these papers essentially serve with a sense of social mission, doing things that they knew frequently wouldn't necessarily gather them a big audience like the Chicago Tribune 10 years ago on the subject of the death penalty in a state where most people were for the death penalty, writing long exposés about not particularly decent guys who are on death row, but on death row for the wrong reason. They, they shouldn't have been there. I mean, we were doing things despite the fact that we knew that no focus group would say, oh, I want two and three and 4,000 more words about the death penalty. Um, so I think there are some questions to be raised as we you know, go, and, and I have a distinct sense of being in some transitional period. As, as we head somewhere down another path, even with all the wonderful uh, you know, new means of, of, of Twitter and Facebook and all at our disposal, which can theoretically get a lot of more information out to folks, I still think there are some real questions about what happens at the local level if you don't have enough revenue to support a high enough quality staff so you can have a CARA reporting in a very sophisticated way rather than some kid at 30,000 bucks or $35,000, you know, just out of Medill or somewhere like that. Uh, and I, to me, that's, that's the big question. What will be the sustainable models for any of these newly flowering, uh, very idealistic, well-intentioned organizations like ours? That I'm going to get to yours in a second, Evan. And, and one of the things, Jim, you, you put your finger on, and it's a worthy topic of discussion, is, is, is the, the social mission of what we all do. The Constitution protects one industry, and that's media. They didn't have the word for media then, but it's a free press. And the idea was that a free press, that you couldn't have a democracy without a free press. The, the mantra of the, of the internet for years has been information wants to be free. You know, I always think it's like people want free information. Information doesn't want anything at all. <laughs> uh, but you talked about a sustainable model. And I mean, one of the things that you're doing, Evan, is, is putting something together that, I don't know, do, will people pay for it? Will that preserve some of the traditional values that we have by packaging it in a new form? Well, that's, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, that's what we've done <clears throat> so far. But I think part of our premise starting out was that you can actually do the stories that we do at, with a sort of smaller scale, a smaller scale operation. So, you know, instead of 
being a magazine that has 100 people working for it, you know, we're very focused on uh, paying the writers to go out into the world, to report on something in depth, find a narrative story, and bring that back. And then we have a very small system of fact checking. We have an in-house fact checker. We have copy editing. But it's all sort of contained, and it's all around each particular story. So you don't actually have to sell that many of those stories in order to make up the, the sort of what you've put out. Um, so that's kind of like one premise that we adopted was, you know, we want to have a small model that is able to, to make its money back and perhaps make a profit and make money for the writers as well. Because if you're going to send someone out for months at a time, obviously that's going to cost them money or you money or both. Um, but I think the other side that we, the way we approached it is, so we sell our stories. So we sell them on the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Nook. We sell them basically as short books. And part of our premise was that in a world where there's so much information, there's so much instant information, Twitter, uh, breaking news all over the web, Huffington Post, that there might be a space for stories that are longer, that have more depth, where someone is actually spending the time not only to sort of get further into the story, but also to find a really comparative, compelling narrative that makes it fun to read. So we are, we're kind of attacking that space, assuming that, well, in the digital world, that's one of the harder things to do. That's one of the things that the web hasn't done very well is sort of create narratives that are longer than 2,500 words. So, you know, and we're finding that there is a niche in there and that with, as long as you keep your overhead low, you can, you can make money. And then, I guess the last thing I would say is, as, as sort of a startup news organization, we, we actually approach it as a tech startup. We're, we're like half an, a news organization with the kind of social values that you talk about, and we're half, a, we have coders who sit right behind me, and so I spend half my day talking about whether such and such video can be shown, you know, do we need to code it in Objective-C? Can it be shown on the Kindle? Can it be shown on the iPad? And so we're taking a very technology first approach to how we kind of tell the stories. So that, and, and they're long, um, but they're not just long. One of the, when, when people on, writers on my staff pitch a story to me and they say, you know, we should do a long story on X. I would say, well, the problem with your pitch is the word long. Um, I think that's my Blackberry, by the way, speaking of short. Um, and, but I do think what you're doing is you're creating something that people might actually want to pay for. We were talking before about, I don't know if people read Keith Richards, oh, there you go, Keith Richards' uh, autobiography, but I was saying to Evan, like, I love the book, but I was just so frustrated that I couldn't hear music and couldn't see video while I was reading it. I mean, the future of book publishing is, is going to be stuff like that. Um, but Joe, speaking of long form, you're a master of long form, and you've been doing it a long time. And even you know, the selling of the president, which I talked about in the beginning, was about how people shape the views of the audience in terms of, of the content that's produced. One of the, you know, uh, the controversies that your book has, has pointed up is this idea that in the new media world, people can't, because it's all pull and not push, you just can find the point of view that agrees with you, and you're not forced, like in the old days, to read a, a contra opinion. Is that part of what has spurred the reaction to your book? Well, I'm not so sure um, about, about that. Um, but I do think, uh, I, I sit here as sort of the, the dinosaur in the room here. Um, probably the only person here who's collecting Social Security. So I have a, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested in, in the future. I like to think I still have a future. However, the kind of work that I've been doing for 40 years uh, has been dependent on the economic model of publishing, reaching an audience with a particular book that makes the publisher feel that if they want to invest in your next book, they're not just throwing money down a drain. So it's dependent on the audience reaction. Uh, some books that I would love to write, I know I can't write because I could never get a contract to write them because the potential audience is simply not big enough. Um, one of the other things that has happened over recent years that I think uh, has been a real uh, step backwards has been the failure of, of, of magazine journalism to s sustain itself. Back in the selling of the president days, uh, there were so many magazines, weekly and monthly, Harper's, The Atlantic, The Saturday Evening Post, uh, that, oh, that printed long form journalism. Th that word didn't exist, but you know, stories. And <clears throat> almost all of them have gone by the wayside. 
Um, I have a friend named Tom Juno, uh, one of the best magazine writers uh, in America, works for Esquire. And we were talking recently about, about uh, a couple of story ideas, and I said, gee, I wouldn't, you know, that might be an interesting thing for me to do for Esquire. He said, well, Joe, we're just, you know, they're not hiring any outside writers. It's all being produced by the staff. So what does a writer like me do if I have a story that I want to tell that a magazine is not going to want to, uh, the magazines aren't there anymore. The last magazine story I wrote was about Sarah Palin's non-existent natural gas pipeline. This was for Condé Nast Portfolio. It was in their next to last issue. I didn't quite close it up, but I came close. Nice work. I spent three weeks, I spent three weeks in Alaska researching that story, and without padding, my expenses came to $12,000. Now, most magazines won't even pay a fee of $12,000 anymore. So what's the writer to do? This is where I look at the gentleman sitting to my right, and I look at Atavist, and I say, this is my savior. This is the new model that can allow people like me to continue to do the kind of work that we'd like to do. We don't have to get a huge advance from a publisher and, and make our decisions based on what's going to be simply commercial. We can tell the stories we want to tell, reach a smaller audience, but he can make money out of it because he doesn't have the big overhead. I think that something like Atavist is, is one of the most dramatic steps forward for this dwindling band of nonfiction writers. You know, there's very few people uh, who support themselves solely by writing anymore. I have a lot of novelist friends who always said that uh, the one thing they would never do is teach. And uh, I can find them now on faculties all over the country because <laughs> they've, uh, they can't sell their books. So now they're teaching. And likewise, the kind of work that I'm doing most nonfiction books are not written by people who make a living out of it. People are either connected to an organization, like Kara writes a book, she writes an excellent book, but she doesn't make her living as a book writer. The book is something extra. John McPhee has written some wonderful, wonderful books over the years. He works for The New Yorker. That's how he makes his living. The books are a supplement. There are very few people. David Halberstam was one. Gay Talese was one. David, of course, is tragically dead. Gay is uh, still working, uh, but uh, not many other people are out there. And no new people are coming into uh, writing nonfiction as for a living because there's no living to be made out of it. Uh, it's, it's a, if it's not a celebrity biography, uh, which maybe we think Sarah Palin is a celebrity biography, but basically the kind of books that, that, that uh, the best nonfiction writers have always been interested in writing, the market seems to have disappeared, not entirely, not entirely. <coughs> Obviously, there's, uh, there are good new books that come out every season. But for the mid-level, the, the mid-level writer who isn't, isn't a star, isn't a guaranteed bestseller, the publishers aren't willing to pay the money. The magazines aren't there anymore. So we need something like Atavist to, to keep this tradition of journalism alive. And there, there are other new forms of that. I mean. Uh, Kindle singles, ebooks. I mean, one of the things that we've done at Time, particularly when a story comes, a cover story comes in that's way too long. Like we, we had a, a cover story by David Vandrele about re new thinking about the Civil War and the South today. It came in at like 10,000 words. We were only going to run five, but then it, we gave the full version to, to then became a Kindle single and a bestseller. Um, didn't make a lot of dough, but that's, that's in the future. Um, so, Iman, I want to turn to you. You're the one person who started out in what used to be a new media, television or broadcast journalism. And, but, but I'd love to know how it has changed for you, right? Because nobody can just do one thing anymore, right? I'm sure you have pressure to, to tweet, to blog, uh, to write stories online. You've gone, you, I, I thought one of the very smart things you said about going to NBC is that NBC, unlike the other broadcast networks, it has a 24-hour cable network, it has a MSNBC website, it has a whole panoply of things, but all that means is you have to do all of those things too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I, in my perspective, I think there's a huge difference between information and knowledge. Um, you know, we all sit in this room and a bomb can go off in Afghanistan and within minutes we're all going to get it on our messages and Facebook and Twitter and what have you, but very few of us will ever understand why that actually happened. And there's a difference between knowledge and information. And there's a difference between media and journalism. I think at the end of the day, uh, 
good journalism will ultimately sell. What we're really challenged with now, and what I think the American public has grown frustrated with, is one-way journalism. One-way journalism is where the journalist stands in a very formal setting, holds the microphone, and tells you what is the most important story that they think is the most important story. But it may not be what you guys think is the most important story. And what's changing now is the fact that there's a much more viewer reporter involvement. And so many times, I mean, just even coming out here, I tweeted and asked people, you know, what do you guys think is the future of journalism? And I got a tremendous amount of feedback from people who would say to me what they think the future of journalism should be. I think what technology has shown us is that if there's a good product, people will buy it. I mean, that's what iTunes shows us, that's what Kindle shows us, that's what anytime there's a good product online, people will be willing to buy it. Um, as a journalist, I think technology has been instrumental in my success as a reporter because I use technology um, as a two-way street. I use it to news gather and I use it to disseminate. There are so many times in the Middle East where you know something is happening in Syria. Journalists are not allowed to get into Syria. Uh, there's a military attack taking place in a small village and I can get on Twitter and message to the 50,000 or so people that follow and say, can somebody give me the contact or eyewitnesses of people that are in humps? And within seconds, I will get people saying, here's a number, here's a contact, here's somebody that you can call. So I will get that information, I will call that person, I will do the journalism part of it, which is verify, uh, report, and then use the very same technology that I used to get that information to put it back out online and to disseminate it to the public. And this has now become a two-way street where I would never have been able to get that contact from you know, my sources. But at the same time, I wasn't able to actually disseminate to a broader audience without that very same technology. So what did they, so, so okay, you, you, you put out a tweet, what's the future of, of journalism? What were some of the things that people said to you? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the, the constant themes that I got was uh, not being told. Uh, media should not be beholden to the interests of the, of the few that decide what gets to be the rundown, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, it's all about viewer involvement and viewer engagement. People want to be able to understand what has happened. They don't want to be told information. They want to be involved in the knowledge process, in the analyzing of that information. But can't this go too far the other way? I mean, I was just uh, on a Fox uh, News show this morning in Chicago. And just before my segment, they uh, had a story about the Red Sox general manager, Theo Epstein, uh, probably going to take over the Chicago Cubs. And they put out a thing on, on the screen, tell us what you think. Will Theo save the Chicago Cubs? Then there was an entire three-minute segment where they showed the responses that they were getting from viewers and saying, this is what so-and-so thinks, this is what so-and-so thinks, this is what so-and-so thinks. Well, of what value is that? I mean, that's engaging an audience, yes, but it's, uh, it's to me, it just was like but wasting a lot at, of time. I mean, one of the things, I mean, this is, uh, it's discouraging in a way. I mean, if you look at all the surveys that have done about internet use and you look at sites like Amazon, people trust peer evaluations more than they trust traditional kind of journalism. So Jim, I would, I would turn to you. I think you're trying to get in here. But wh what I wonder is, do people even understand what journalism is and what role that it plays? And if, if, if they value the opinions or views of their peers, what role is there for somebody, a Mandarin like yourself, you know, talking about, you know, what's important and why. Yeah, I mean, I think there's less and less uh, a sense of, of that and what are trustworthy sources versus untrustworthy sources. I think it's a complicated issue and it also deals with the educational system, the lack of civics education, uh, people not knowing the difference between, you know, the person blabbing on Fox or MSNBC and somebody like Kara who may have taken two weeks to, uh, you know, assess a problem. I think we are also partly to blame if you take an area like political coverage. I think we have simply taken the political system's obsession over the last 20, 30 years for making mountains out, out of molehills, for going negative, and our obsession with tactics and strategy has fed right into that, and you've got a big echo chamber. If you look at a lot of the, the debate coverage of the Republican debate this morning in lots of mainstream media, including the Wall Street Journal, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, you will see stories about stagecraft, about artifice, about how people were trying to position themselves. I went, uh, because I had a two-year-old who was friggin' up at 5.30 in the morning, I, was, uh, I got to read more of this stuff than I had planned, and it wasn't until I stumbled upon a Bloomberg story, they were a co-sponsor of the debate last night, 
that I learned not only what these guys were saying on some substantial economic issues, but a very quick, seemingly sophisticated analysis of what they were saying. That when Romney says that the Obama health care plan costs a billion bucks, it's BS. When Perry said that he uh, created uh, something like 50,000 uh, taxpayer-funded uh, jobs in uh, Texas, that it's BS. When uh, Herman Cain talks about somehow balancing the budget in a year, it is absolutely, totally uh, impossible. But I do worry about whether or not my kids growing up, working with an iPad, um, are going to have some sense of where there's an air of authority. And it's a question I've got for you, because it's interesting. You work for now a network news operation, which is in some ways imperiled by some of the very technology that it's employing. So there's street demonstrations in Cairo, and I don't have to wait for my friend Brian Williams. I'm not going to wait for my friend Brian Williams, because whether it's on my mobile device or it's on my Mac, I'm going to be seeing dozens, maybe hundreds, of, of video from folks there. And I've got no clue who I might trust. How does one sort that out, particularly not for necessarily the sophisticated news may, consumer may, journalist, but the person who just may be sitting in Keokuk or Patterson, New Jersey, and goes on YouTube, and there are 50 videos of the demonstration. I, see, I, I'd have to disagree with pretty much everyone. Maybe because I'm not wearing a blue blazer, but um, <laughs> and missing a certain chromosome. We're not but, wearing pink pants. Okay. That's true. <laughs> not pink. They're a different color. Um, that said, there is nothing wrong with these people speaking up. It, there, there's no reason to, to abandon ethics and at the same time, ex ethics standards, accuracy, fairness. What we believe in All Things D is all those things are critically important, including the brand, the idea that you trust our brand, but at the same time, there's incredibly valuable things being brought up by readers. I've always thought readers were smarter than I was. I've always thought that. At the Washington Post, I used to put my email, when email wasn't very popular, when it was just coming out. And the reporters were like, why do you want to hear from the readers? Like, I was like, well, they're kind of smart. They tell me things. They know things and stuff. And I think there's, the argument that comes from old media about this stuff is that, oh, this stuff isn't trustworthy. Oh, this stuff isn't right. This stuff isn't vetted. It's not entirely true. One, because first of all, I had an argument with someone the other day. I love the New York Times, but it's a bunch of white dudes and a lady who all live on the Upper East Side, OK? Upper West Side. Whatever. I don't know where they live. <laughs> whatever. It's the same people. It's the same people. Secondly, people are smart, and they can rise above the noise. There's lots of tools to be able to allow them to rise above the noise. And you're going to get the trolls, but at the same time, you're going to get a much more rich and valuable system. And when we do news stories, we don't base them on what readers tell us. We do our reporting. But at the same time, we have a huge and healthy respect for the story as it's ongoing. And it gets better and better and better. And so I don't know why he would mind getting more video. It, it adds richness to his story. Uh, but Kara, I'm, uh, lest I you know, wind up caricatured here as, as Luddite, right. uh, my question it's simply all, is. old dude who doesn't like the, who's shaking his uh, fist at the internet. And as a white dude who grew up on the Upper West Side. <laughs> and is wearing shaking a deep, his fist at the wearing a deep, damn deep blue internet. blazer. Um, <laughs> my, my, the tie uh, is fantastic. Uh, th thank you, thank you. Yeah, got, got, in, got, got, got in London. Um, question is. I think it's great that all that stuff is out there, that there, that there is in some ways destruction of a small group of folks as the gatekeepers. I think there's the, the populism and the lowercase democracy to it all is salutary. My question is, tell me about the business models whereby this fellow and Brian Williams can make the sort of money uh, telling you about what's going on in Cairo in a day in which You've been submerged with right, but folks let's, on the street. Right, why don't you? I, I want you to weigh to in on that. Because, okay, but, yeah, but the thing is, just talking about the the importance of that, and 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 you will talk about this. But the the time that Twitter got, kind of blew me away was with the Iranian uprising, like four years ago, where people were tweeting in real time about what was happening, and it's not like they're trusted sources or not. It's real time primary source information. I mean, if you had Benjamin Franklin tweeting from the Constitutional Convention, you'd have a lot fewer books written about what happened at the Constitutional Convention, because we'd know. We'd be able to kind of sort it out. How does that affect, I, 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 right, I don't know how you continue to pay Brian Williams so much money, but, <laughs> uh, 
But how does that affect your reporting? Because, because in a way, it's like, how do you compete with those folks? Sure. For, first of all, I want to say very briefly, I don't care where anybody watches a single one of my news reports. I don't care if they watch it on TV. I don't care if they watch it on an iPad. I don't care if they watch it on their watch. If they're in a metro and they look down, there's a little screen, and there I pop up with like the two minutes. That's not my concern. So that's for the really brainiacs technology people and unfortunately, the big corporations who delay the rolling out of the technology and how quickly I can get my report to you. So that's one part of it. I, I want people to be able to consume news and products anywhere. I think one of the biggest challenges is what I call, and this is very timely, the Steve Jobs case, which is Steve Jobs died Wednesday, I believe it was Wednesday night, after most of the American Nightly newscast had finished. By Thursday the next night, all three networks led with Steve Jobs' death. There isn't a single piece of information on any of the three networks at 7.30 on Thursday that I learned that I didn't learn just by normal, regular consumption of information. I didn't go out of my way to, to do anything. I didn't pick up a newspaper, but just by logging on the internet, going, opening my you know, Gmail account, friends posting things on Facebook. I can't tell you the number of people who have linked Steve Jobs' 2005 commencement address at Stanford, and yet somehow, the newscasts on Thursday decided that would be such an important element that maybe they dug it up, that nobody knew about it. I was like, honestly, I mean, like, would you, <laughs> have, have any of you just turned on you know, the internet? I mean, in that kind of expression, turn on the internet, which obviously you don't turn on, but. Um, <clears throat> I didn't say that I'm new to the company. I don't want to you know, like ruffle any feathers. So. <laughs> but, but my point is, so I, you know, when you come talk about model, and, and this is just a personal theory, and I could be completely wrong, but one, one idea that I think might work um, is that the internet itself needs to be restructured in the sense that you know, all of us today have a television set or most have a television set where you know, some of us will pay $150 to get the premium channels of HBO and the 27 showtimes and the, you know, the stars and encore. Some of us just want the very basic 11 channels and pay the $50 a month. And I don't think that that model is necessarily a wrong model to apply to the internet. Now, I don't think that all of us here visit the trillion websites that exist. We probably, and most technology statistics show, we visit about a dozen to two dozen websites uh, on a regular basis and spend a lot of time there. So why would an internet company come and charge me you know, $100 to be able to have access to a trillion websites when I only use 10 websites? If they're willing to give me access to the New York Times and to Time Magazine and to the Atavis for an additional $5 fee flat, I'm not paying per usage, I'm still getting the full experience of Time, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. But charge me $8 for the internet and $4 for every package of websites that I want to use, a bundle of websites. And you can start packaging these bundles per fee. So if you want the international news channel bundle, you can get for $4 the Al Jazeera English, the Al Jazeera Arabic, the BBC, the Russia Today. Now you may not want that. You may be very content with a few American newspapers and you'll pay the $4 for it. But at the end of the day, once you pay those $4, there's none of this going back like, you know, here's $1.99 for this premium opinion article. I don't want to pay $2 to hear somebody's opinion. And that's the bottom line. I want to be able to access the internet, but I understand that if I'm going to give you guys a really good product, that comes with costs. And that's why I go back to that point I made earlier. The American public and consumers are willing to pay for good products. If you increase the quality of the journalism, you increase the quality of the, pr the product, people will pay for it. And the final point, which, which was about making the, the material more enriching. One of the cool projects that NBC is working on, I happened to learn this yesterday, was that they have an amazing archive that goes all the way back to the 1920s when Universal Media uh, used to do the, the news clips. And so what they did is this book, I think about John F. Kennedy, the presidency of John F. Kennedy, that's called 50 Days. And they've made an iPad application that goes along with this book. And as you're reading the book, there are pictures of John F. Kennedy. And if you tap on it, you get to see the report that was filed on the day John F. Kennedy gave a certain speech, or when Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis went to Paris. And it's such an enriching experience, I couldn't put it down. I mean, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I mean, I didn't live around the time of John F. Kennedy, but I mean, he's such a legendary figure that I want to learn as much as possible. But also, I'm so fascinated by how reporters back then used to cover presidents, and how polite they were, and how they <laughs> used to like, treat them with so much. I'm like, nobody does that nowadays. This guy was like, you know, a surreal experience. So I think that the technology is going to take my package, my report, news report, sorry for the lingo, and it's going to put it on the website. And you know, when there's an, an Atavist article about Egypt, there'll also be a little video from NBC about the, the revolution. And then you know, perhaps also a link to a longer format book. And 
you guys are all going to get this great product for just a small fee of $3.99. So you know why the record album exists? Because somebody invented long playing technology where it used to be just singles, like it is now again, but, but they invented a longer playing record and so that created the album and everybody grew up, we grew up thinking albums are sort of organic. But, but technology changes cultural form and I'd love you two to talk about this. We were talking about Steve Jobs on the way in and I was being skeptical. Well, how did, how did all of that, everything that he did change the forms of the thing that we consume? But they have in a radical way Absolutely. and I'd, I'd love you to talk about that because I think a lot of us old media types think, well, well, what is the value of a tweet that's only 140 characters? But believe me, you know, 20 years from now they'll have collected books of the best tweets of the, you know, of the decade. We've already done that. But well, you can also right. get now charged $25,000 if you're a celebrity to tweet a product that endorses right. it. So, you yeah, know. Yeah, the Kardashians so. are geniuses, I by was the way. They're say, leading you know, the way, the Kardashians. Yeah. Follow them. Right. For $25,000, you can get Kim Kardashian to endorse a product. You'll be fine. Um, know, so. that, she has a credit card. That, that, you know that? that woman go. is a visionary in some <laughs> respects that people should learn from. She's horrible at the same time. But um, <laughs> here's the thing. One of the things I always say when I give speeches, you know, old media, when I go to old media events and talk to speeches, is what, a lot of these formats, or does, the way formats are, is because the media likes it that way, right. not because people consume it that way. And what's important, I always go, I always start every speech by going, the kids love it. The kids love the internet. They love their iPhones. They love their mobile. Stop arguing about what, sh what would happen. You don't have a right to be in business. You know, the way the media co should cover itself, the way it covers Groupon. You know what I mean? Good God, the kind of stories on Groupon, including myself. Um, but I mean, they, they feel like they have a right to exist and, and, and not have economic realities imposed on them. So one of the things that they don't want to do is adapt to the way people want to consume media based on the technology. And people like smartphones. People like iPads. People like, uh, they like to get their news in little bursts. People like Facebook. Stop arguing. Stop and start to adapt and create really good quality things. And so the technology is important. This smartphone, what you're carrying in your, even that old Blackberry you got, um, <laughs> what you're carrying there is a mo more powerful computer than you had 10 years ago, a right. powerful computing device where you can get almost any piece of information. It's gigantically a big opportunity, a gigantic opportunity for media to take advantage of it. And they just have to stop saying, well, I wish it wasn't so, and I wish it was and start to do things like what the Atavist doing, what we're doing. We don't get rid of quality, and we don't get rid of accuracy, we don't get rid of fairness, but we adapt. We don't make as much money as Brian Williams. Maybe Brian Williams shouldn't make as much money. Maybe nobody wants to watch Brian Williams. That's too bad for Brian Williams, but it's not bad for the consumer. And so you have to start thinking, what do people want to have, and how do they want to consume their devices? So you think but what the technology that, is, what the technology is doing, and I, I've been saying this for for 10 years, and people would argue with me, but people are not arguing anymore, uh, <clears throat> that the visual image is replacing the written word as the basic unit of communication. That because technology now enables us to see everything as it's happening, to go back and see the coverage of JFK and not just read about it, who wants to read about it? Because it's a more immediate impact to actually see it and to hear it. Uh, the written word was a way of explaining things to a reader, but if you can show them and tell them through live action and through visual imagery, it's much more powerful. And, you know, basically, the printed word has had a good long run. It started with Gutenberg, and it's run up until Steve Jobs. And now I think that phase is is ebbing and it's being replaced by something new which will be much more visual in impact and which is much more suitable for the new technology that we have. You, you use all of them. Even, but he uses at, all of them though. Yeah, the, you're, right, you're uniting all of them. But, but the only, what, what I take exception to you about that, Joe, and it may be a temporary thing. I mean, the rise of email, more people around the world typed more since the rise of email than any time in human history. Like, I learned to type when I was 18. My kids learned to type when they were eight and nine years old. They, you know, they've already written more emails than I probably ever wrote at that age. But you on their little iPads, 
or iPhones, it's pretty tough to type, you know? Maybe if you're a little kid, you can do it, but I, uh, I had to give up on my Android phone because I just couldn't type on those little keys. So I have an iPad now, but even there, you know, I'm just not dexterous enough to... Uh, to <laughs> Maybe it's that you don't have to choose. I mean, that's what... That, it, it kills media that they have to think that the consumer can choose. Right. If consumer wants text, they can have text. If they want video, they want video. If they want audio, they want audio. If they want... There's a, there's a site called Pinterest, which just got huge funding and it's worth $200 million for some odd reason. It, you know, you just pin pictures of things you like up and everyone talks about them. It doesn't matter. Like, you ha we have to stop arguing about the media, like what, how it's coming through, and right. realize you can do anything. That's and right. And, and if I can just add to that, I mean, I, I completely agree with you, but it, one of the biggest daunting challenges that I think journalists face or that they haven't come to grips with yet, especially the, the key decision makers, is they're really annoyed about the fact that when they make a rundown, they are the ones prioritizing the stories, which none of us in this room may think are the important stories. So they may decide to lead with this story, when in reality, everyone in this room thinks something completely different. And so what's the first thing everyone's going to do when they see that come up as the lead story? I don't think that's the lead story. Change the channel. I, I don't want to waste my time watching a three-minute report about the weather when I don't think the weather is the most important story. But how story do you get around that? Well, <coughs> but consumers are. They don't care what you think. I mean, I, they don't care what I think. But so you're saying that, so the evening news, well, which is a dinosaur, but even that idea that there's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy in the evening news. There's a hierarchy on the front page of, of a physical newspaper. People, people don't want you to say this is more important than that. Right, and I think this is why, you know, if I can say my opinion on this subject, even within NBC and others, is that stop putting so much emphasis on what the lead story is. Give me the best stories that you worked on for today, and you know that if they're important stories, people will find a way to get to them. And just make sure that they're getting out to the public on their technology-driven resources, and people will choose. You know what, I think Egypt is the most important story for me. I want to watch what all the three networks did about Egypt today. And somebody else may think, no, I want to know what the jobs are. Somebody may think it's a health story. <coughs> but if you're sitting there thinking, you know what, I have 22 minutes, so I'm going to lead with a health story, then a weather story, then a job story, I'm not even going to put Egypt on the, on the list of foreign news items, you're monopolizing your 22 minutes and you're probably turning off viewers. The way I look at it is the, the viewership of nightly news and others are declining not because people suddenly don't want news, is that everything you're telling them at 7.30 p.m. at night, they've already consumed right. in some way, shape, right. or fashion. So, Evan, what, what, is, what does Rick do with a, with a weekly magazine ah, that's a good faced question. with this? What do you do, Rick? Well, is, there a future for, is there a future for the weekly every, magazine? Every form still exists, like radio exists. Uh, all people still make pottery. You know the the. Oh, print, don't compare yourself to pottery. <laughs> pottery, but, it's harsh. But, but it's all. But it, there's a range of the way that. Yeah, don't please, please don't tweet that. Please uh, do, <laughs> everybody. Time magazine equals pottery. But <laughs> see now, but right there, um, Allie and Claire are covering this in real time, blogging about it, tweeting about it. We're on every single platform that there oh, is. I mean, you should have told me that before we started. We were, you know, <laughs> no, you're and, trying. And so, and, and so, in a way, the, the print, mag print magazine is a legacy product, but it's a product from a brand, and you might say, you know what, I love, I love getting on my mobile platform the tweets that Claire and Allie are doing. And you know what, you know, I'll throw in for you, I'm charging you for that, and I'll throw in this print magazine that comes out once a week. There are plenty of people, for example, you know, we have uh, 12 or 13 million unique users a month online. A lot of them are young people. You know, they read a, s a story on time.com, and they will be pleasantly surprised to discover there's a print product that goes with it, too. Yeah. And so I think that people, people will have every different form of media. But here's, yeah, the, other, here's the other thing that you have to do. As managing editor, you have to make judgments on what's going to go into that magazine every week, because you don't have room for everything. Well, that's true. But that, it's a and, more of a, bes online you it's could. a bespoke, right, exactly. Online you you don't have to make those yeah. decisions online. But even online is shrinking. I mean, and Evan, I'd ask you, I mean, how, how does your technology answer some of these questions? Well, I mean, first I would say that I, I would just agree that really the difference now to me is that you have to make an argument to the readers like, or, or the listeners or the watchers. Like, you have to make an argument that you're the place that they're going to go to for that story and that information. I mean, the reason that I would read All Things D if, if a story broke about AOL you know, buying up TechCrunch or something like that is because I know that they have reliable reporting, I've been there before, they have the context, they have people who have sources. I'm, I could get the actual information of that happening in a lot of places, right. but I would go there and they've created a community of people who want to go there because they've proven reliable in the past. And so we're trying to do that in a different way, which is we're trying to make an argument that 
we're telling a story that you can't read anywhere else. You can go online and you won't find this narrative about this topic. And the way that technology enables that, to your earlier point, is that you know, in the sort of print era, you know, we went around to a lot of publishers before we even launched, and we said, we want to do things that are longer than magazines and shorter than books. But there's really no one that deals with that. At the time, there was no one that dealt with that, because in a magazine, if it's longer than 10,000 words, you don't have the ad pages for it. If it's a book and it's shorter than you know, 75,000 words, you're not going to be able to sell a $25 hardback of it. So, but the platforms have enabled you to create a form that actually wasn't viable before. So it doesn't, it's not an answer to all the questions about, say, local news and, and those sorts of things. I don't have the answers to those questions, but I think it is true that rather than looking at the, the technology and you know, the iPad or the iPhone as sort of taking away from these older models, they actually open up these new doors of you know, people standing there reading their Kindle. The old Kindle, all it was ever good for was reading books. You can't surf the web on it very well. You can't do anything on it. And millions of people bought them to read books. So it's opened up a way to reach those readers that just didn't exist before. It's interesting. Um, you know, I brought up the business before about, uh, say, state legislatures, which I think traditionally were not particularly well covered, and where I do think the great skullduggery takes place, and not less so in Congress, where you've got probably three reporters for every you know, representative. But at the same time, at a place like Illinois, and I assume it's the same in Sacramento and, and Albany, uh, you've got fewer reporters. You, you, when you dig down and talk to some of them, the old grizzled hands, and find out what their work life is like, you know, they're tweeting, they're sending out video, there are ways you can get, uh, go online and get video of, of hearings in the Illinois legislature. There's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of information that one couldn't get before. Reporter for the Tribune was telling me the other day, he had a radio interview in Quad Cities the other day, and he just will, uh, let folks, you know, link to it, which is, and he's a very smart guy, a very good guy. Five, ten years ago, would have no, you, uh, did you speak, what'd you say on that radio broadcast in Quad Cities? So there's kind of an interesting, you know, tension here with sort of the, uh, the challenge of diminished resources and the upside of the technology enabling you to do what people really want, which is get the stuff real, real fast. And it'll be interesting to see, especially Kara and, and Evan, in an era of personalization where you're sort of spending the money on what you think you want, what happens to these sort of, sort of lower prior, traditional lower priority items, the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services and stuff like that? Because you can't imagine many people spending much money to get stuff on that. but. It was there once upon a time, even if you picked up the paper on your way to the lifestyle section or the sports section, you might stumble into that little expose about the screwed up foster care system. So it'll just be interesting well, to see you what know, happens. It's interesting because we, I think about resources a lot because I don't have a lot. I don't get a lot from very wealthy News Corp. I wish they would give me more. But, um, <laughs> We do a lot more with less people. It's just the way it is. You, we didn't, you know, I worked in the Washington Post newsroom. I love the Washington Post. I love the Wall Street Journal newsroom. But there were a lot of people there doing a lot of nothing. You know what I mean? A very expensive lot of nothing. And so you can really pare down. And not, I pay my reporters better than the journal pays. They don't know that, but I just said that. Um, we, 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 have a, we, have we have great health care systems. We do everything. But it's, a, it's like five people versus 25. Okay, five people who are really dedicated and passionate about it. And I don't work them any harder than I worked when I was a journal reporter. We broke the Meg Whitman HP story, the Carol Bart's being fired story. We broke we break stories every single day. They've got ten reporters. We have one. How does that happen? How does that work? Is it because we're smarter? Is it because we're working better? New media just has to re realize yeah. that. Cons besides the fact that consumers want what they want, and that's something you should respect. You can do it with a lot less and in new ways. And I do think there'll be someone who'll cover the Illinois uh, uh, legislature better than some of the old reporters used to. I mean, I come it's on. Easy, it's, in fact, I mean, it's easier now. I mean, in the sense that, and somebody who wants to find that can find it. I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't remember exactly when we first met, but the first presidential campaign I ever covered was 1988. I don't know if you were out there then. But in 1988, I had, I had two suitcases. <clears throat> One had clothes. And one had all the position papers, all the speeches, all the white papers of all the candidates. I'd carry that around, right? Because this is, this is the information, the coin of the realm that we needed. And as all of us who've covered presidential campaigns know, you go to a, a whistle stop, the candidate gets up, and about 20 minutes before, they give you the text of the speech, or they used to in the old days. And you'd be standing there reading it. And there would be a little you know, uh, rope barrier there. And voters, actual American citizens, would look over and go, hey, where'd you get that? Where, how, 
how could I get one of those? Well, you can't because I'm doing something exclusive. Now every voter in America has access to way more information than we had in the days when we had information that seemed exclusive, right? You know, a candidate's website, every speech, every position paper, he's blogging, he's tweeting. I mean, it's, it's actually incumbent on citizens to do more. There's more available. But there's other formats. ProPublica has won Pulitzer after Pulitzer recently. The whole news system where essentially they have rich people paying for, for great journals. I mean, you know, they get, it's, it's not charity journalists. That's not what I want to call it, but it's, a, it's fun by the guy who was the editor of the Wall Street Journal, Paul Steiger. Tremendous right. work they're doing there. It's a different system. Someone else is going to come up with a different system. I mean, media has to become entrepreneurial. I don't know why they feel like they, you know, it's not like a priesthood. It's not like they deserve to be in business. They need to become entrepreneurial and they have to stop complaining about that. You have to try new things and be willing because the consumer has taken control and they're not giving it back. It, they're not giving it back in music, in movies, in entertainment, in any part of their lives. And so how do you fit in with accurate, fair, quality journalism in that? You, you become entrepreneurial. I agree, that's a big I question. Like to think so we only, you know, let's, you know, we have only five minutes left and this has been like a fantastic panel. But what I'd love each of you to do is, be, you know, take a couple of minutes and say like what, and I'll let you talk about what you're going to say, <laughs> and then and say what what will the media journalistic environment look like five years from now, ten years from now? I mean, how how different will it be? And and I know in a way what you're doing is actually something that's available now. But you know, two or three years from now, that might seem like that might seem as much of a dinosaur as as print. So I'd love you to kind of look in that crystal ball and say for everybody here, like what is what are things going to look like five years, ten years from now? <coughs> I'm on. Okay. Well, I was just going to say really very quickly before I answer that, which is on the issue of radio. You know, I'm a news junkie. I consume new news. I don't know a single dial in this country for NPR. I don't know where to find it in any, any city I go to. But I know that I can always go to NPR.org and I'll find every story that I'm looking for. And I, it's the same thing on my, on my iPad and iPhone. So when, when you talk about the radio, you know, radio has, has had an increase because of technology. And I think that's what is the underlying theme here. Technology is going to enhance journalism once some of these corporate institutions of journalism figure that out and stop fighting it but actually right. embrace it. Because once, like I was saying earlier, that once they figure out the best way to deliver to everyone in this room the three minute story or the 60 minute story about Egypt or the documentary, I'm in great shape because like I said, I don't care where you watch it. I don't care when you watch it. I just care that you have a chance to have the right to watch it. And that's the most important thing for me as a journalist is that you guys, if you're interested in a story about the Middle East or sports or the Cubs, you have the right to be able to find it and get to it. My biggest concern and my biggest challenge and one of the reasons why I came to NBC is that people never necessarily had the choice. You know, if you're watching nightly news, you're being told the 22 minutes of what they think is the important news story. Now I think people are going to be more engaged, they have better choices, uh, and with that not only more information, but a greater civic responsibility to be more knowledgeable. And that's where reporters come in. You know, you guys can see all the YouTube video in the world, but you will not understand that YouTube video if you don't have somebody there that you trust that you go to regularly and say, you know what, I know Brian Williams is a trusted source. That's why I want to hear what his take on the situation is. And that's why people are more accepting of slightly opinionated news. Not pure opinion, but people that are a little bit more polemic. People who question when the US comes out and says, we foiled an Iranian plot to kill the Saudi Arabian ambassador. You're like, wait a minute, honestly, really? Is that really how you, you know, are we dumb enough to think that it's just going to be that straightforward that we're going to buy into it? No, you're going to question it. You're going to be like, why are you saying this now? Why, what are you greasing the wheels for? And that's the spirit of the old journalism, which hasn't gone away, which will always be there. But now you'll be able to hear it in so many different platforms. Great. So let's go around the horn. Jim, talk, talk about what the future is going to look like. And, uh, this and is tougher. Then my wife, who a Pulitzer Prize winner, is now in the uh, early childhood education nonprofit and found herself on the Today Show last week. And Al Roker asked her to, in 60 seconds, tell us all about early childhood education, what we should be looking <laughs> for for our kids. She actually did it. Um, so in like 30 seconds, I mean, I can bemoan. Uh, you've, got, in, you've got 90 seconds. I can bemoan in Luddite-like fashion, take out my clay tablet, and bemoan <laughs> Um, some problems I do think we now face, particularly in the political realm, lack of cooperation, it's near impossibility to reach consensus everywhere. Um, and I can bemoan some of the potential problems of fragmentation and I think on a local level, uh, lack of social cohesion. It's a very complicated matter, but <laughs> lack of social cohesion, lack of sense of community is significant. That said, 
I think people, journalists like myself, are, are terrible historians, and we too often forget what came before us, and that, you know, Steve Jobs, visionary, but there's going to be another Steve Jobs, and just like there was an alphabet and a clay tablet and a printing press and undersea cables and satellites, there's going to be something else which we're going to harness in really intelligent, innovative ways, even if guys like me, you know, go into that new world kicking and screaming. And I think the technology is so wonderfully powerful as I watch my two-year-old fiddle with an iPad. I mean, you know, he'll never know what a mouse is as he takes his finger, as my seven-year-old becomes like a mini chess savant playing chess on, on the Macintosh. I think there's a, a wonderfully bright future. We'll figure out some ways to get people to pay for quality, and we'll harness this technology and get it to people where they want it. And whether it's Kara's stuff on Silicon Valley, your stuff on, on Egypt, or Joe on Sarah Palin, or Evan, a 15,000-word piece on uh, poverty in the Horn of Africa, it'll be easily accessible. And I think uh, you know, a, a golden era potentially is, is beckoning. Great. I'm on. I, I second that. I mean, I, I answered some of that in, in my previous one, but I completely think technology is the key. And all of the examples that you just gave, at the end of the day, it's all about you. It's all about the viewers to have the right to choose. And that's my main concern, is to have the viewers empowered to make the choice of how and when and where they consume the journalism, because that's never going away. People will always be inquisitive. They'll need to understand. They want to make sense. And they're going to become a better, a better informed citizenry with those choices. Jeff. I'm not quite so optimistic, um, <laughs> because that's I think you live next to Sarah Palin for a year. Well, that's good. That could be. <laughs> yeah, uh, I learned to keep my head down. Yeah. But uh, people um, have the right to choose, and as there's so much more to choose from, they tend to choose what reinforces what they already believe. People don't seek out Sarah Palin uh, when she was elected mayor. She presided over her first city council meeting. And uh, a friend of hers, somebody who voted for her as mayor of Wasilla, gave her a book at the end of the meeting because he was worried about, her. she was so ignorant in so many ways. And he gave her uh, Heilbronner's book called Worldly Philosophers to teach her something about economics through the biographies of some of the most influential economists, economists through, the, through the centuries. And she wouldn't even take the book out of his hands. She put her own hand out and said, no, no, no. I never read anything that might challenge my beliefs. <laughs> now, I'm afraid that palinization is spreading through technology, and people who only want to watch Fox News, because that tells them what they already believe, are going to be, and people who only want to watch MSNBC, because that tells them what they want to believe, are going to carry that mindset over to the internet and all the wonderful opportunities that are available. Who seeks out difficult information? Tell me something that I already know is right to strengthen my position, but I don't want to have somebody arguing with me through technology. That's my less optimistic <laughs> point of view. Kara. Then again, you are talking about Sarah Palin. No, <laughs> I'm way beyond that. <laughs> okay. Um, five things. Media will be promiscuous, more promiscuous than ever, which is fantastic in life and in uh, media, meaning it will be everywhere. Um, it, will, it will have to be everywhere and wherever people want to consume it. So if people want to, if you want to print the news on salami and eat it, fantastic. So promiscuity is really important for media going forward. Two, in that vein, ubiquity. It's going to be everywhere, embedded in screens. One of the important things is screen technologies that are coming. Um, are really, I was just in Korea and saw some astonishingly thin screens and amazing screens, touch screens especially, that react and react to people in an environment. Um, you know, one of the things that's important about screens is my kid is uh, five, six years old, and we bought, got a big new uh, screen. He touched the television screen, and it didn't do something. And he said, "Mom, this screen is broken. Like, what's going on? It is broken. Those screens have to start interacting with you in the environment." The third thing that's going to be really important is that it's going to be noisier. It just is. There's more of it. There's no way it's not going to be noisy. Um, that's OK. You can't panic when it's noisy. Because I, I firmly believe in our bet at All Things D and at different places is that quality does rise to the top. And people want quality. They just <coughs> You don't want bad milk. You don't want bad water. you just like, oh, please, let me buy a bad quart of milk. Let me buy it. <coughs> that's what people do care about quality. And so, so there's a certain audience that cares about it. There's always the Sarah Palin's of the world. They do become more ignorant. I don't think people were trying to seek out differences before. I just don't think they were in essence. I know my grandmother certainly wasn't. Um, 
and last, uh, lastly, the, the most important is that you have to be entirely flexible and entrepreneurial. If you don't, you won't exist. And you have to change and take some lessons that come from Steve Jobs and from Silicon Valley that failure is really important. It's OK to fail. It's OK if certain things go away and something else will replace it. And you have to get used to that in this paradigm, because this is what how people are consuming it. And it's kind of like arguing against um, just cars, you know what I mean, or highways, or something like that. Um, it's very hard to argue against that they have, they've had their negative parts, but it's also made our society better. And one of the things that's critically important, which I think is just horrible, is our, our federal government, in terms of this, has been has lain down on the job. Korea, China, all these all these other societies place a big important part on technology learning and math and science um, and getting all these technologies broadband, high speed internet. We are the highest. We're the highest prices in broadband uh, access for people uh, widely in this country. And we have, I think we're like number 26 in terms of quality and in terms of speed and everything else. The government has to get involved much more heavily in getting this stuff out to everybody in, in, in our country at all levels of economic levels. Because if we don't, it's sort of like saying, you know, tin cans were really good for instead of the telephone. Or those dirt roads, fantastic, instead of the state highway system. It's a really important thing to get the, to have the federal government behind this. And they've just lain down on the job. And it's all about a public, as, you, as people who cover Washington, all about public, about private interests taking over this. It's a critically important part of our future. And if we don't get on that, China's going to run right past us. Korea's going to run right past us, every country. Well said. So. Evan. So I, I think everyone's covered it very well. I would, just, I would just follow up on the entrepreneurial point, because I think that there is going to be a sort of rise of smaller news entities, literary entities. The, the technology enables people to actually reach a large audience and an international audience very quickly and very easily if they find the right niche. So I think that something like the iPad, which has already had a relatively large impact on how people consume news information, is only and it's less than two years old. So it's really at the beginning of these sorts of things. And what seems to be happening is a lot of you know, small outfits will start, but it's not really mutually exclusive. It's not like the New York Times goes away, as people like to say. You know, the New York Times will, will quit printing or, or will shut down. It's, the New York Times, is they're on top of things now. They know the impact that technology has, so they co-opt things that they see in smaller organizations. And I think that you'll see this mix of the rise of new organizations, you know, whether it's us or someone else puts us out of business in two years because there's something we didn't anticipate. But it's just moving a lot faster. But I think it's exciting because it enables smaller organizations to actually do quality work and find an audience for it. And the same way, I think, you know, to, to Joe's point earlier, there might be a little bit of a return of, of the author, of the professional writer, in the sense that it's possible for individuals to even create their own small models, to go produce their own work, whether it's direct to Kindle or you know, on the web, and find ways to even you know, make money off that work. It's not maybe the same money you get from a book advance, but I think that it's, it's sort of spreading out, and it's offering new opportunities at the same time that it's sort of taking down some of the older publishing industry or, or news industry. Well, I'm actually incredibly optimistic about the future. I think that there will be more and different ways of information that's available to people. We have to be agnostic about what form that it takes. And I think there will be actually new forms that will be created, new kinds of journalism, new kinds of content, nonfiction and fiction, that will revolutionize the way we think about things. Um, you know, someone was saying that there, the, you know, their two-year-old was just now just swipes everything that, that she sees. I mean, we're, we're, we're moving into a new era, which I think is, is, is actually fantastic. We just can't keep looking backward. There'll also be but, jetpacks. I'm sorry? There'll be jetpacks for yeah. everybody. <laughs> okay, good. But yeah. well, they thought that the Jetsons. You know, but, I'm, I'm going to leave oh. this, with this notion now, I'm gonna, uh, because particularly as the lunch hour is beckoning, can I get a decent news on salami sandwich? I wonder if I can get some decent. <laughs> Delicious. Uh, <laughs> And you have to be promiscuous about it, too. Um, it's the, but the right way to think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the, but the one thing I know about the, about the future of media is that if we don't have the incredible content produced by the smart, talented, competent people up on this stage, then, then all is lost. But I know that will be true. And I want to thank you so much for being here. I thought it was a really fascinating panel. Thank you, I Richard. learned a lot. And all of you, please keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.